Christmas is a great family event for children, for seniors, for adults, young adults. Christmas is for everybody, and we are so glad that we have the opportunity to sing about the divine child who came to save the world. In our home, over the years, uh, Christmas celebrations begin on Christmas Eve, when we gather together and uh, as uh, family. And this year, we had all generations from great grand mother <laughs> to grandmother to parents and children and grandchildren and all that. And uh, uh, we usually have a time of fellowship and singing carols and reading the Christmas story and uh, praying uh, before the children uh, share the gifts. And last night, I uh, before, before the prayer, I asked our grandchildren, uh, when you give gifts, what do you give? The, what kind of gifts do you give? Used things, second hand? And they all in one chorus said, give the best and give what's new. So I guess the parents have been doing their job, at least on that. This is a great time to teach about giving and about the fact that God gave his best. And like we heard uh, the story to the children that uh, Jesus is with you. And most of all, with the dispossessed, the lonely, the lost, and as we give thanks to God for all the blessings that we have. We have blessings. Our families are not perfect. But we can still give thanks to God, right? We can still give thanks to God for all the blessings He's given to us. There are no perfect families anywhere. <laughs> uh, people pretend a lot, but uh, that doesn't make it perfect. <laughs> the reality is that every family is flawed. Every person is flawed. Every human being is, is desperate and in need of help, and uh, only God can save. Only Jesus can set us free from our sins. There is no other Savior. And that is a message that we have to keep on telling, not only during Christmas time, but throughout the year, if we love people, if we care for them, we wouldn't just talk nonsense about the realities of life. The best thing you can do for your friends, if you know Jesus as your personal savior, is to tell them about him. And I'm so glad that, that so many of you are doing that. And why we thank God for all the blessings that we receive, we through our Hope Hamper program and all the other undocumented events, and acts of charity and love that we do, we are reflecting what God has done for us. As Christians, as disciples of Christ, we really don't even give because we feel like we are better than anybody else or even give because we feel good, because that would be a kind of selfish motivation. Now, we know in the reality is that a lot of people who reach the top professionally and in business, after they succeed, after they succeed and they have an abundance, and this is not a judgment or criticism of anybody, but this is the reality of it, after they reach a certain level of an abundance of disposable income, uh, they become very altruistic and uh, do a lot of charity and so on. But you can do charity uh, for significance because now you reach the top and uh, you're successful and now you need significance. And uh, we don't know the thinking of people, but that's the reality uh, uh, in life. 
But as disciples of Christ, when we give, we give out of gratitude because we have already been given. And Paul calls it the unspeakable or indescribable gift that God gave to us. The gift God gave to us cannot be measured in human terms, in terms of gold and silver, or any value cannot be put on it. It is priceless. And when you come to know Jesus as your personal Savior and have experienced the forgiveness of sins, and you know nothing in this world can save you except the blood of Jesus, and it changed your life and forgotten and forgiven your sins and made you a new person, that gratitude for what God has given is what motivates me to give to others. Not because by giving I get something back, and uh, not because if you give God your bicycle, you'll get a motorcycle. What kind of nonsense is that? But it's preached from by Christian preachers. Or if you give your car, you'll get an aeroplane. You don't need to give to God in order to get an aeroplane or a helicopter. If you do a good job and earn money, uh, you can do it. And millions of people around the world, uh, rich people, <laughs> Uh, own all these things, and they exclude God from their lives. God is nowhere there. We don't need God to help us in business. We don't need God to help us be successful. We can do it ourselves, as many millions of people have proven. There is one thing that we need God for, which no one can help us with. For a few moments, I want to focus on that. And we're looking at Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, the story of the shepherds. Luke 2, 14, these are messages that are given to the shepherds. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Again, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Let's just focus for a moment on that one word, peace. There's a lot of tension in the world today. Recently, there's a lot of tension over the recognition of Jerusalem as a capital by the United States. A lot of huff about nothing, actually. Uh, and people, many Christians are misled, thinking that that has something to do with uh, Christianity. Actually, it has nothing to do with it. Those are political decisions. Nations can recognize whoever they want. God is not held captive by those things. And the current state of Israel is not continuous with the Old Testament nation of Israel. When Jesus was born as the Messiah, it closed the chapter. And we have seen about Israel we are singing actually about the Israel of God, which is us. We are the Israel of God. We are the princes with God. We are the people who are the new Israel. But that's another story. Let's talk about world peace. There will be no peace. There will be no lasting peace in this world until Jesus returns. There will be piecemeal situations where there will be peace among nations and so on. But all that is temporary. In fact, if you read the prophecies of Jesus in Matthew 24, he said as, as time goes on, with the passage of time, things will get worse in the world. A nation will rise up against nation kingdom against kingdom, and there will be wars and rumors of wars in many places, among nations and tribes, before Jesus returns. So what does the future look like for world peace? It doesn't look that great. The United Nations can make all the pronouncements they want, and they can take all the votes they want. That's not going to bring world peace, because we are looking for the second Christmas which is a bigger Christmas 
when Jesus returns in the clouds of glory and then after the great white throne judgment he will create the new heavens and the new earth and there will be peace for all eternity that is the coming of the Lord Jesus also talked about the peace that the world gives if you will remember Jesus said my peace I live with you my peace I give unto you then he said a very strange thing not as the world gives give I unto you not as the world gives there is a peace that the world gives that's different from the peace that Jesus gives when somebody publishes a magazine article or puts something on the YouTube and say that they were meditating somewhere watching a beautiful sunset and repeating some things and they had a sense of peace they are not lying there is a peace that comes a worldly peace that comes is not the peace of God is not the peace that Jesus gives actually I would venture to say that serial killers and psychopaths have a kind of peace because they have a seared conscience and there is nothing that troubles them they keep on killing or keep on doing the evil deeds they do and they're not troubled at all by it there is a peace that the world gives but let me tell you about the most important peace and that is a peace that you can receive as your greatest Christmas gift if you don't if you haven't received that peace and the Bible calls it peace with God why do we call it peace with God because all human beings are alienated from God by birth and no matter what religious ritual you may go through every single human being who is born into this planet has the stain and the nature of sin within them and that is why we sin we don't become sinners because we sin but we sin because we are sinners and no one can say that they have not sinned everybody from birth is alienated from God you say but I'm a good person like many people say I do so many good deeds I do charity and I do charity in a sacrificial way I don't harm anybody do you call me a sinner I'm not a follower of God I don't believe even in the existence of God but I'm a good man are you telling me that I'm an enemy of God it's like this let's say there was a rich man there was a rich man and a good man who was a dog lover he had many dogs that he looked after very nicely and then he had a son also who was a dog lover the son is a brilliant guy and uh, passed all his exams and had a good job and lots of disposable income but he just did not get on with his father at all and he all throughout his adult life he ignored his father he had no communication with him didn't care about his birthdays or anything like that the father lived his life he was a good man the son was also a good man he lived his life but there was no connection between the two at all and occasionally or regularly rather this son who was also a dog lover would come and pet the dogs his father's dogs 
and he would even feed the dogs. He got round the father's servants, and the father knew that his son was coming on the sly and petting the dogs. He was doing good to the father's dogs. Do you think that that made the father happy and that re-established the relationship between the father and son? Do you think so? Do you think so? No, just because you do good to the dogs doesn't mean that the enmity between you and your father is removed. There are a lot of people who do good to God's creation, do many wonderful things. They feed the hungry, they support orphanages, they do all kinds of good deeds, but they block God out of their life. They ignore him totally. There is no relationship between them and God. They're totally alienated from God. It doesn't matter how much good you do because you cannot buy favor, just like the son can't buy favor with his father by feeding the dogs. You can't buy favor with God by doing good to humanity. You buy favor with God, that's something really that you cannot buy, by a simple process, a very simple process, so simple, but it's still the most profound of all. Pick up the phone, call your dad, and tell him, Dad, I've ignored you all these years and treated you like a nobody. I haven't even cared that you're around, but I'm deeply sorry for what I have done for having hurt your feelings. Will you please forgive me? The moment you do that with all sincerity, what happens? What happens? The relationship gets reestablished, and there is peace with the father and the son. And that is the condition of humanity, alienated from God. Please don't fool yourself thinking that your good deeds will save you. You're in for an eternal surprise, and then it'll be too late. The only way, the only way to, be at, to have peace with God is to come to him, realizing that you have ignored him. You may be the president of the Rotary Club. You may be a paragon of virtue. You may be the most admired and respected person on the planet. You may be a person who is flawless, a man or woman of integrity. But if you ignored God, you've committed the biggest sin. That's what the Bible says that we are justified by faith and we have now peace with God. Finally, I want to tell you about the peace of God. When you have peace with God, you have the peace of God inside you. Your relationship with God results and reflects in the inner peace that you have. That is the peace of God that Jesus gives. That is what Jesus talked about. But you know, many people who follow Christ have times and periods in their lives when they have, do not have the peace of God, even though they had peace with God. You know why? I want to tell you about three possible wolves that will destroy the peace of God in your life, even though you may be at peace with God. And during Christmas time, we sometimes temporarily, you know, put our problems and difficulties on hold. But there are broken homes. There are situations where you're not healed even though you're praying for healing and nothing is happening. There are insoluble situations and conflicts and, and financial issues and other physical and relational issues. And those things rob the peace of God from you, even though you are at peace with God. 
God wants you to have his peace in you, and not only to be at peace with him, but to have the peace of God in your life, whatever the situation may be. Firstly, unconfessed sin will take away the peace of God from your life. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you knowingly do things that are contrary to God's word, that will take the peace of God out of your life. You will be restless. And you will not be able to cope with it because your conscience will be bothering you. You may be a child of God, but, but you slip here and you slip there and you don't put it right with God. That will rob the peace of God from your life. Unconfessed sin will rob the peace of God. Unbridled anxiety and fear will take peace away from your life, the peace of God. Even the disciples were concerned about themselves and their future. Some were grumbling about their height, like some people do. More people gripe about their weight than about their height. But anyway, these guys, I know they were talking to each other, they were measuring themselves, and one said, you're, you're taller than me, I'm taller than you, and all this kind of thing. And, uh, and they were probably uh, looking at each other and said, your nose is too big and your ears are too much like uh, mug ears and so on. And Jesus walked into their conversation. What are you worrying about these things? Why are you worried about what you will eat, what you will drink, and what you will put on? How many people, you know, worried about what they put on? Uh, but Jesus said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't have anxiety about tomorrow, but because anxiety and unreasonable fear, all fears are not bad. If you have fear to walk on the rail track, that's a good fear. <laughs> but unreasonable fear, unbridled anxiety can rob the peace of God out of your life. That is why the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 4 and verses 6 and 7, he says that in everything give thanks and let the peace of God that passes all understanding, I say all understanding and misunderstanding too, the peace of God that passes all understanding. Let it guard your hearts and minds. The peace of God will be like a garrison guarding you and sustaining you during times of difficulty. The peace of God. Bring your concerns to God. Be anxious about nothing. It's easier said than done. And I'm, I'm an anxious person by nature. My wife is not. So sometimes I get checked because sometimes my anxiety is about nothing, really. And sometimes you can get used to fear and anxiety so that you can become uncomfortable without it. because you're living in a comfort zone of anxiety. <laughs> but what does the Lord tell us? Be anxious about nothing. You have a situation that you do not know how to handle. You've got a bad report. You know something about God? The great thing about God is even if the devil does it, God can turn it around. Yes, God can turn it around on its head and do something out of that situation that glorifies him because God is sovereign. He never gets checkmated. He's in control. And even when 
when sometimes we experience defeat, and don't think that Christians don't uh, experience defeat. Paul said, uh, I want to come to you many times, he wrote to Thessalonians, and he said, but Satan hindered us. Paul, hindered by Satan, yes. Those things do happen. But God is sovereign. He's in control. And, and convince yourself from the Word of God that He's the sovereign Lord of the universe, and He, he will work out His purpose in your life uh, as you walk with Him. And the last wolf is that will rob the peace out of your life, even if you are a child of God, is unresolved conflicts. Conflicts with people. People in your workplace, your in-laws who may act like outlaws, your friends, and you say to yourself, with friends like that, who needs enemies? People who say useless things, make false accusations. We are not all always innocent. But we know that there are times when we are innocent and we are falsely accused. And we know that people problems really can drag you down. The reality is that it's people who bring us the greatest joy, is it not? It's people, not machines, not gadgets. You know, there are so many gadget freaks, they can get happy with a gadget for a few moments, and then before long, uh, and the marketing guys know that, uh, there's a new gadget coming along with hardly any uh, changes that are worth talking about, but because it's new, the gadget freak buys it. And the other guys, you know, laughing all the way to the bank. So. Gadgets and things don't bring us happiness, it's always people. But the other side of it is the people who bring us the most amount of pain also, is it not? How many of you know that? You don't know? There are a bunch of saints here. Am I the only sinner? Huh? <laughs> it's people who bring us pain. People bring us joy, people bring us pain. Now, what does the Bible say about that? About relational conflicts, family conflicts, broken friendships, people who let you down? How can you have the peace of God when there are relational conflicts? Well, Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, the Apostle Paul says, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts and minds. Well, if the peace has to rule, then there's something underneath that is militating against it, right? There's a simple, practical, biblical formula about the peace of God that gets robbed out of your life because people misbehave. In the book of Romans, in chapter 12, the Apostle Paul says this very practical term, if at all possible, live at peace with all men. It is sometimes not practically possible to be at peace with all. Well, the best example of that is no other person than the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, so many people were at war with him, that's why he got crucified. But he was innocent. He did his part to make peace. And when you have relational conflicts that are troubling you and robbing the peace in your life, do everything within your power to put it right. And there comes a point where you realize nothing you do is going to bring peace, and you just leave it there. Leave it there and let God work. But don't take revenge. Don't retaliate, because that will rob the peace of God out of your life. So Paul says, if your enemy hung hungers, feed him. Don't say, jolly good that you're hungry. When your enemy falls in trouble, don't say, serves him right.
You know what that does? That displeases God and robs the peace out of your life. You may have peace with God, but you may not have the peace of God if you don't really follow what God wants you to do. But if you obey Him, eat humble pie sometimes, you'll have the peace of God and be able to go on. I pray that the peace of God will be your portion. And if you don't have peace with God, that you will have peace with God. You can be a good man, but be at war with God. You can put yourself right this morning.